Hello, Uggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's episode is brought to you by you. You are the folks who provide the patron and PayPal and tip jar and all that other kind of support which brings these channels, which brings this channel to you. So thank you to my sponsors, you. Now, let's look at the question for today. Actually, two questions from Stephen Cram, KD6KXT, in Novato, California. Now, he has said that uh, it seems like everybody's getting an ICOM 7300, and I've certainly talked to a lot of people with that radio. It's been part of the reference station here for years. Uh, my reference station is a layout of a station that would work on HF, and it contains everything from the power supply all the way through to the antenna. And the rig in there is the ICOM 7300. Now, there have been some uh, newer rigs come out in the ASU line uh, that look very interesting. And, of course, the purpose of a reference design, something to look at, and maybe you'll change something about that to suit you. Uh, he has an interesting uh, way of describing the ICOM 7300 as the small block Chevy of the UHF or of the HF world. <laughs> now um, he has two questions here: one regarding regarding vertical antennas. Now um, let's talk a little bit about verticals. Verticals are uh, antennas that have vertical polarization on HF, on UHF, on anything. Uh, they are generally a quarter wavelength of something sticking up in the air. And if it's ground mounted, it has a bunch of radials. If it is uh, mounted up higher than about 10 feet, um, it needs tuned radials two for each band. So if the antenna covers uh, uh, 40, 20, 15, and 10, you need uh, two quarter wavelength radials for each band radiating out from the top. Some people tend to slope them down a little bit because that will raise the input impedance of the antenna. A vertical antenna has an input impedance of about 30 ohms, give or take. Now, that all depends on conditions. Now, this is the first point I want to make about antennas here, is we talk about antennas, the dipole 50 ohm. Well, no, that's not true. The dipole at a true quarter wavelength has a uh, real component that can vary from 30 to 70 ohms, depending on height and other things around it. And it has a reactive component that can vary around 37 ohms and so on. So you're looking at about a 1.6 SWR, 1.6 to 1. So that gives us the, the basic idea of our dipole and our vertical antenna. Okay, They will have a somewhat of a resistive impedance, match, impedance mismatch, and they will have a bit of a reactive component. Now, your antenna tuner can take that reactive component out of there as, not as, as long as it's not too big to be a problem. Now, he talks about vertical antennas, which again, as I've described, is just sticking in the air with some radials, or they make them to where it's an NFED half wave that doesn't need radials, but does need a little bit of a counterpoise. Now, the thing that um, he points out here is, I have long heard the complaint that they are prone to picking up noise. Well, an antenna will pick up whatever is offered to it. Now, as it turns out, it is said that most man-made noise is vertically polarized, and so therefore that noise would be picked up by the antenna, whereas a horizontally polarized dipole will be 90 degrees uh, tilted from that and not pick up as much noise. Now, I have never seen a study or anything in print that attempts to measure this noise, measure the polarization, um, nor does it talk about 
anything that I have seen about verticals and noise sources, okay? So I'm going to go with the idea that it is conventional wisdom that most man-made noise is vertically polarized and thus picked up more by a vertical antenna. On the antennas that I have now, I have not seen that to be the case. They're about equal, okay? About equal. Now, the key thing to look at is whether the uh, one antenna versus another, and you can kind of look at this on a spectrum scope, uh, what you're interested in is not the absolute level of the signal. What you're interested in is the signal to noise ratio measured in dB. So let's look at this on the whiteboard for just a minute. Let's just take a look at a, a typical vertical antenna. Uh, this is one quarter wavelength where lambda is the wavelength and you have multiple um, radials at the bottom of whatever length you want them to be uh, if it's ground mounted. Now the bottom of the antenna of course is insulated from the ground and then these radials right here are gathered together in a radial plate or something that connects to the outside of the coax. So if you've got your coax coming in here okay and it's like this then the uh, center conductor goes to the center here and this right here the shield comes out and attaches to the radials and if you really want to be thorough about this you'll go ahead and put in a ground rod here okay and then that attaches now note that what is reflective of the uh, wavelength because the wave goes up here and here hits these and goes like that um, what is doing that are the radials now Technically, radials act as a counterpoise, sort of a capacitive thing. It's a reactive element, whereas the ground is ground, is resistive. And uh, this right here just makes sure that this coax is unbalanced. Okay. The advantage of the vertical is that the lobe direction is low. And so you can tend to work longer distances on the vertical than you can on a horizontal dipole. A horizontal dipole, uh, if we have it uh, coming straight out of the board like this, okay, has a somewhat higher radiation angle. And the radiation angle is directly a function of the height the height up to one half wavelength. Okay, so if this is a 40 meter dipole, it'll be 66 feet long and a half wavelength will be 66 feet in the air. Very few can get an antenna that high in the air. So as you go down, the um, radiation pattern goes up. If you go up past a half a wavelength. Let me show you what happens. Let's suppose this is past a half a wavelength. You start to get your uh, beam will do this bit. Okay, so right in here there's no radiation, but you get two beams. This beam keeps coming down toward Earth, but this one doesn't. And the stronger this, this is at one wavelength. Now at less than that this beam tends to come back until it disappears when the antenna is one half wavelength high. Okay he says uh, we talked about the part about antennas picking up uh, more noise. Okay so now let's just take a quick peek at his second question which is for something entirely different. He's talking about the uh, 
mobile transceiver for his truck, which would be 2 meter and 70 centimeter FM. And I wonder what would be the advantage of a transceiver that has two separate receivers as opposed to a more simple two band one receiver unit. This is called dual watch where you can listen to two separate frequencies at once. And note that on some radios, those don't, those don't have to be on different bands. They can be on the same band. Now, a dual watch uh, receiver would be good if there's some repeater that uh, isn't used much, but is used for, say, search and rescue or something like that. You can have that as one, and then most of the time, your favorite uh, repeater will be there. Now, he also, if that, and that's fine if that's something that you're looking for. Um, my understanding is that the two, I could hear both bands at the same time. That's true, and it can be very confusing to understand uh, which one is the one it's coming in on. Uh, perhaps from separate speakers, I don't know necessarily that all the dual watch transceivers have two speakers in them. Um, he says perhaps that could be information overload while driving. I would say that it would be. While driving, I'd keep it on single band, single repeater, and then you know where your information is coming from. You don't have to check the radio to see which band it is coming on or so on. The other thing he asks is about crossband. Now, crossband is a feature where you can transmit like on 70 centimeters and then you turn around and receive on two meters. Now, why would that be important? You can actually set that up as a crossband repeater. And uh, I did an example once with repeaters on two meters. You do a crossband with your uh, mobile unit that is in your uh, home base station and then you can operate with a 70 centimeter handheld talk to your base station which will then talk to the repeater I even demonstrated that feature once crossband is a feature you will seldom use except for talking to satellites if you're going to talk to the popular low earth orbit FM satellites you will need to go up on uh, UHF and down on two meters or vice versa as I've outlined it here, you've got this crossband feature and you've got this dual watch feature. And I would have to stretch to come up with use cases uh, for those. Some people put those in their radios because they like to add features. And these days, radios are sold on the feature list rather than on the quality of the radio itself. And as I have shown many times on this channel, when testing uh, Chinese radios, for example, that their technical quality of the output stage isn't as good as it should be. And whereas you look at a Japanese radio and it will have excellent performance in terms of harmonics in the right place and things like that. So to finish up with your question, um, uh, Stephen, I think that uh, first, we're talking about vertical antennas. Lots of people love vertical antennas. I have one. Um, I have a couple up right now. And I've got a hex beam up. And then um, I've got a pole that I can put up a... Um, I have a pole that I can put up an infant dipole. And that's very handy too. And frankly, I don't observe much difference in the noise between the two although we do live in the countryside so there's not that much of an issue so there you have it again this video is sponsored by you please check out my patron page or whatever and see if you can uh, send a dollar or two this way uh, as part of the patron and uh, that would be greatly appreciated also please click like please subscribe and please share. Um, at the end of this video is a list of our patrons. We update this list every month, and it was just updated for this. So there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.